Thank you, David, very much. And it's a pleasure to be here with you folks today in your, in your retreat, the Southern Arizona Leadership Council. There's a long record of community service, of really doing things in a bipartisan basis, I must say. When you look at some of your successes, it's uh, not known by everybody just how much you get involved in community and state issues, whether it's the environment or whether it's transportation, even increasing taxes, which you have participated in. No easy task. And uh, I, I compliment you for that. I want to thank David Cohen, your incoming chair, for the introduction. Of course, General Maxwell, uh, for his leadership, and the prior General Schutman for his leadership of this great organization, now taking on the chair of the Board of Regents. And I don't know if Fred Boyce is still here, but my former colleague on the uh, Board of Regents, that's time consuming. And uh, I thank them for the tremendous uh, efforts that they put forward. And uh, there's so many people here, uh, your Greg White leaving and, and uh, Julie Williams and the leadership here is outstanding. And I know I'm not gonna start mentioning names, Steve and others that I know of because I'll leave somebody out. Uh, Hank Amos was nice enough to come up and say hello to me because he and his father uh, and I were in the same fraternities. And fortunately, uh, neither one of us want to talk too much about those days, uh, but uh, Buddy, Buddy was a great, great friend. And I've been asked, uh, oh, by the way, uh, Chuff Coughlin, I mean, he's remarkable, isn't he? I, I'm so glad I got here in time to listen to him. And, you know, he's, he's been voted the, the best political operative in Arizona by the Capital Times, which is really something, because there's a lot of good political operatives, excluding myself for sure. I'm not in that business anymore, but there are to be the best, and he just proved it to, to today. And our treasurer-elect, thank you very much for your demonstration of what bipartisanism is about. And I suspect that had a lot to do with your success in eight years in the legislature, uh, even with when it's tipped in one direction or another, you, you have to show some bipartisan if you really want to get things done that are going to last and not create enemies that are going to also last. Now, they asked me to, Ted uh, Maxwell asked me to talk about recent trends, and I think uh, Coughlin did, did that much better than I can. But let me give you a little history for those of you who might remember. I was elected in 1976. I was 39 years old. My father, Evo Deaconcini, had been very active in politics. In those days, judges had to run on the ballot, just like any other candidate. He'd been a Superior Court judge, Attorney General, Supreme Court judge, after he retired from the Supreme Court judge because he couldn't afford to put, send my brother to Georgetown University and another three children to college on the salary of a, of a Supreme Court judge. He came back and practiced law and made some fortune in real estate investments. Uh, he then became the chairman of the state Democratic Party. And uh, Ernest McFarland was a senator that Barry Goldwater beat. And my father was very close to, to Senator McFarland. And two campaigns that McFarland and Goldwater ran against, my father was the state chairman of the Democratic Party. So I grew up thinking, oh my god, Barry Goldwater. Boy. This guy, how did Arizona elect him? You know, well, he turned Arizona from a, a blue state to a purple state to a red state. And uh, so I give you that background because when I got elected and went back there, I thought, you know, there's every reason that this fine senator might not be real friendly. And I was prepared for that, and I kept, quite frankly would not have blamed him too much. And it wasn't that way. When I came back there, Goldwater opened his doors to me, offered to help me. He, he always called me Denny. Now, it was a fact that my aunt, my mother's sister, was chairman of the Republican Party in Graham County, which probably only had 20 members in those days, but uh, Barry, Barry used to always talk about Zola. And, uh, and, and my mother-in-law at the time was gone to school with Barry, and she was a Republican. But he had every reason. But that isn't what he did. He put his state first, he put his country first, and he welcomed me, and he helped me. He actually helped me succeed as a young Democrat senator, the other party, to succeed. And he did it because it was good for Arizona, 
Now, it turned out secondarily to be very good for me, but he did it for Arizona because that's the kind of people the Goldwaters were in this state. The Goldwaters and the Udalls, different perspectives in politics, but they respected each other and their families. And you've seen some of those debates that uh, Morris Udall and Goldwater discussions they used to have. And that's what, it, how it worked in those days. And those were called the good old days, which were kind of lost a little bit. But I want to talk a little bit about it because how did it happen that we got things done when you were in the minority if the Republicans were in control, you were in the majority if the Democrats, if I was in, my party was in control, because we worked on a compromise basis, as Ben Franklin said, a democracy can't survive if you cannot compromise. And that's one of the problems we have. And where, where does that stem from? It stems from the inability to have the same facts or truth before you when you're trying to make a decision of what political position you're going to take on the issue. If you take welfare reform, welfare reform, the real welfare reform that was vastly needed started under Ronald Reagan. And he had a bipartisan committee that put together the truth, the facts, just how many people were able to work that weren't working. How many people actually applied for jobs and didn't? How many people just sat home and collected the checks? You know, if you're very conservative, you might say, oh, 90% of them could, could, could go to work. We need to get them off. And if you're very liberal, to the left, you might say, oh, 10%, or, you know, it's, just, it's just only a small number. It wasn't. I can't remember what it was in those days. I was there. But it came out what the real truth, I call it truth instead of the facts, because now with alternative facts and the false news and the cyber that we have, you, you, it's very confusing. And if you rely on the alternative facts or the facts that you want to believe instead of what the true facts are, and then you are able to round up the votes to put it across as a, as a law, as a decision, the other side is forced to accept it. And what happens when you're forced to do something you don't want to do? You get angry. You don't like it. You say, wait a minute, I'm not going to put up with this. And sometimes people kind of lose it. And they start calling people all kinds of names. And yet they're in the same chamber. They're in the same committees. And that's what happened to us in this country. Instead of the, the normal behavior, uh, we need to find a way and to get back to the compromise. And another couple of examples. Those of you who might remember Ronald Reagan's position. When he ran for, for, for president, he was very much anti-immigration. We're not going to let him in as this country. This destroying this country. He ran on that, and he made inroads on that. When he got elected, he decided. If for, for a while, he had, he had the uh, the uh, majority in the Senate and the House. He also ran on doing away with some government agencies, eliminate the Department of Education, eliminate the EPA, eliminate the uh, the public defenders. All federal programs. Those are things he ran on. He got elected, and he started to doing those. And, the, and Republicans were in control of the Senate, and we had a vote by the Republican-controlled Senate to eliminate the Environmental Protection Agency, because he wanted to vote on it. And it was turned down. The Republican majority turned it down. And what happened as a result of that? People like Bob Dole, Howard Baker, Paul Laxall of Nevada, some of them became very close friends of mine, they went to see Ronnie. And they told me this story. And they said, Mr. President, if you want to do something about overstretching and overregulating and reaching too far, in the EPA, there certainly have been examples of that right here in our, in our agriculture community. Irrigating water that comes off after irrigating field can't be put back into a canal because it's picked up some, some pesticides, you know, and, and so, you know, what do farmers do? Stop the water? You can't stop the water, you know? But those were things that he could do, and they told, they told him. And Bob told, told, told me this, and, uh, and uh, Paul Laxell, they told the president. And Blacksall was very close to him. He was his uh, campaign manager. And they had been formed, they'd been governors together. You can't do it that way. You have to work for compromise. 
He became, in my opinion, a very substantive president. At first, he was on rocky grounds, but he took advice from his own party leaders, and he started to working with people. And on occasion, he'd call people like Dennis DeConcini and Sam Nunn down to his office and say, I want to talk to you about this legislation. And if he told you he was going to do something, he did it. And he did a couple of things for me. And then he, he decided that was, was convinced that you had to do something about immigration. So he asked the Congress to pass the creation of an immigration commission, which happened to be passed. And it required four senators, four House members, and four uh, members of his cabinet, of his cabinet, and then eight other members from labor, business, and what have you. And you couldn't just send a representative. If you were the senator, you had to show up. And I was one of the four senators. And if you were a cabinet member, you had to show up or you didn't participate, or you couldn't vote, or didn't participate. We worked for eight, I believe it was eight and nine months, on gathering the real truth, just how many undocumented aliens, aliens, immigrants were really in our country. We had figures ranging from 15 million to 4 million. Nobody knew, but just whatever you wanted to do, if you were one side of it, you took this figure to the other side. How many of them had criminal records? Nobody really knew. Was it 200,000 or 2 million? Oh, well, it depended on what political side you were on. So we hired this, they hired the staff. They went out and they found out those figures. They found out truthfully that there was approximately 8 million undocumented immigrants in this country at that time. So with that figure, what did we do? We put together a recommendation for legislation that provided a pathway to citizenship over a period of time, providing they didn't have a criminal record, providing that they were, were employed or attempted to be employed, providing they paid attention to the laws and the, and the regulations, and Reagan signed that. That was because there was truthfulness in the figures that were presented to the decision makers. To me today is one of the biggest problems we have is that we don't know what the truthfulness figures are. It depends on what side of the aisle you're at, whether it's a Democrat or Republican. That to me has to change. Can it change? I like to think it can. I think it can change as it did in, in those days, there was consternation between the parties. But once you were able to put together the real facts and figures, you can find some compromise. One example that was done on the Senate, in the, in the Senate uh, a, a conference room, which I happened to be just sitting in, I had nothing to do with the compromise that was being negotiated, but we had just come off the Judiciary Committee hearing, and I was sitting in a conference room talking to my staff and Ted Kennedy and Orrin Hatch, two people that were so far apart you couldn't believe it. They were both on, the, on this committee. They were both on the committee that dealt with the issue of, uh, of family leave, and we had legislation. And those two gentlemen, senators, sat down. I just paid attention. I had nothing to do with it, but I really paid attention. How, well, how they compromised to get legislation. Senator Hatch, very conservative from Utah, had a number of Mormon women who were single, single moms who got a sick child, they lost their job, sick parent, Ted Kennedy, his position, I can't remember, I'm just kind of, kind of exaggerating now, he probably wanted family leave for perpetuity, who knows, uh, being, being the, the, the so-called liberal. And, uh, and uh, fortunately, uh, they came up, and I believe it's three weeks unless it's still, uh, still been changed someplace, they came up with legislation. That's difficult to find today in the United States Senate or the House, because everybody's dug in, and I believe it's because they've dug in on what they call the facts, which not always is the truth. And in my position, that's what we have to go back to, is putting together some way that there can be some effort to establish this capability to get to the truth so people can decide to compromise. And in my judgment, that's where we, 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 we have to go. We saw the, what happened in, in our state uh, 
Kristen Sinema was elected. I'm very pleased being a Democrat. I supported her. Uh, she, she, she ran a good campaign, and you watched her campaign. She stayed in the center, because that's where Arizona is, I believe. Not far to the right or far to the left. And I compliment uh, C Congressman uh, Woman McSally for her concession statement. It's very sad to see the negative campaigning. And as uh, Chuck talked about the ne negative campaigning, when I used to run for office, very seldom would you do any negative campaigning. It just, it was, you did negative research, so when you had debates, you could talk about why did you vote this way, Senator DeConcini or Congressman Steiger, why did you vote this way, and you'd have to answer it, and you could answer, but rarely did they do this TV. It accelerated in my last election, we had some, and when I, my first election, it was the first negative campaign I ever saw, and it's because I had voted for the Panama Canal, and my opponent ran a you know, picture of the Panama Canal, a heartbeat going away. This is what Senator DeConcini gave away to the dictators, you know, and what have you. So, but that, that was rare. It was very, very rare. And I did that too. I wasn't exempt from, from not using negative campaigns. But it has gotten now where the outside money is, as uh, Chuck Koffler pointed out, is just, is just the, almost destroyed the capabilities to stop any of that because candidates know that it doesn't work, because it really doesn't work. But outside groups do. So getting back to what we need to do here, and, and, and as Chuck pointed out, the, the House picked up 39 Democrats, and, and the Senate picked up two, two Republicans, and uh, the largest uh, popular vote turnout for Democrats since the Watergate time, which is quite significant. And uh, this just, to me, demonstrates that there is a time that things are changing. Like he said, is it a Trump reason? Maybe so. But I think it's more a reason of reasonable people with respect for each other, respect for the job and the position you hold, regardless of your party. Think of the person you're talking to, the office they hold, before you think, you know, I don't like their political party because this is where they are on a certain issue. In politics, in government, respect is what, to me, it's all about. That's the way I was raised in a family. That's the way I tried to practice. I'm sure I'd, I didn't follow that all the time, but to me, that's what needed to be done. It needs to be done today. And this is where SAL, SALC comes in, in my judgment. You have been community leaders, state leaders, really, on the issues here that have really made some difference. And maybe you have discussed this in your retreat, I don't know. And maybe it's something you don't want to get into because of the obvious landmines that are there. But perhaps you should consider taking this issue on about how to establish bipartisan commissions or approaches that you might help with the universities or something, whatever the issue is, and see if you can help the legislators and the people who have to make the judgments on starting with what I call the truth, the facts, the truth. And that's what I believe we need to do, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, suggesting something to this great organization that you've already done, shown so much leadership, but I would sure hope that you might consider doing that. And we Democrat leaders, which I'm no longer one, and Republican leaders, and Democrats and public officials, we need to hold our leaders responsible we need to be willing to take on and criticize our own party leaders. And as Chuck pointed out, what will the Democrats do? Well, historically, we're pretty good at screwing up presidential elections. And if you're a Republican, you, you can say, oh, good, maybe, maybe it'll be Pocahontas uh, who, who gets the nomination or, or, or you know, Bernie Sanders, the socialist, or whatever it is, and Democrats are good, good at uh, losing elections too. But uh, it, you know, if the Democrats stay with their with their value and don't do the identity uh, issues, and he's so right in my opinion, the Democrats lost because they they lost the perspective. Who have the Democrats been nationally known? They've been known for helping working people. They've been known for minority support but not for just number one issue, same-sex marriage. That's gonna be our issue, boy gosh. Well, it's a very important issue to a lot of people, but I don't think it's the national issue that you're going to decide uh, an, an, an election on. 
and uh, or transgender, or you know, it, it, just, it just gets me to see where the, the, the Democratic Party has happened. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your for your time and uh, and and your leadership of SALC, and I hope you might consider getting involved in this ex exercise that I think is so necessary that we bring together and establish what are the really facts, the true facts, and then try to make decisions based on that rather than just, well, this is what I think is the facts, this is what my computer tells me are the facts, this is what the the, uh, you know, when I get over the, the, the computer and the internet, this is, oh, there's gotta be, that's gotta be the case, my gosh sakes. And thank you very much, thank you, General.